But, but meantime, lest we forget... I am a prevention violence minister, and I know who causes violence in the world. It is white cis men. Yeah, well, that is no, white no. cis men. Prime Minister Chris Hipkins with us. Morning to you. Good morning. You sick of hearing that? Uh, yeah, look, it's certainly not a form of words I would have chosen. In fact, they're wrong. So, um, Madam has clarified them. Clearly, there was, you know, it was a, a regrettable situation, um, and I accept her clarification of what she was intending to say. Did she embarrass you? Uh, look, it's. I think she gets a little bit of leeway for the fact that she'd just been hit by a motorcycle, and clearly, I think the adrenaline was probably pumping at that point, and you probably detected that in the tone of her comments. Um, but they, but they were wrong. Her comments were wrong. Did she apologise? Um, she'd already contacted my office yesterday to indicate that I think the, the video, um, you know, having seen the video, did not convey the message that she was trying to convey um, and in conversations, you know, agreed to clarify her words. Did she agree to clarify her words once your office got in touch with her? In other words, there was no apology at all and she's not apologetic. She's just been told to say something on your instruction. My understanding is that her office actually contacted mine rather than the other way around. Um, but you know, I, I think clearly the words that she ended up using were not the message that she was trying to convey. Indeed not, but she's not apologised, has she? Uh, not to my knowledge. That's ultimately a decision for her. Have you talked to her at all? Uh, I had a text message conversation with her. Um, the there time are two different things. A&E. You can have a text message or a conversation. Which was it? Well, it was a text message. She was at A&E at the time, and so I decided that it was not the right time to have a conversation with her on the phone. Have you talked to her at all? Uh, I know. Well, other than via text message, no. Um, I, have had a, I did have a conversation on the day with James Shaw, um, her co-leader, who was in touch with her. Was he embarrassed? Um, we did, haven't had a conversation about this specific issue. This came to light after those conversations. Right, so sorry. You had a conversation with James Shaw about something completely different. Well, no, about the incidents that happened over the weekend, in particular at the protests, which resulted in Marta Bantley being hit by a motorcycle. And we had a, quite a lengthy conversation about that. But you didn't talk about what she had said specifically about white cis males? I don't think either of us were aware of that at the time. So you as Prime Minister have not actually talked to her or James Shaw or anybody in person about this whole thing at all? No, there's been conversations between our officers. Right, so the officers have dealt with it, have they? Well, they've certainly had conversations. Marama has clarified what she said. I'm satisfied with the clarification that she's issued. So you don't think that one of your ministers going rogue requires you to have a personal conversation with her in any way, shape or form? Well, she'd been hit by a motorcycle. I think that um, she gets a little bit of... Uh, How long does the leeway last? Leeway Are you going to get to her today or tomorrow? Or are we waiting for the concussion to subside? What's the problem here? Well, she's clarified her comments, Mike. I think, as I indicated, um, you know, the, the comments that she made were immediately after being hit by a motorbike. Um, I don't think any of us would be at our best in those kind of circumstances. Uh, well, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a prime minister of a country and a minister who's gone rogue and said something completely inaccurate, if not racist, is not only <laughs> not only doesn't apologise, isn't dealt with in any way, shape, or form, and isn't even dealt with in person by the person who employs her. Well, she's clarified her comments, and I'm satisfied with the clarification that she's issued. So your handling of it is exemplary as far as you're concerned? Uh, look, I think it was a regrettable situation. I no, think no, it not the situation, your <laughs> handling of it. In other words, you haven't even had a... You've not even talked to her about it. No, well, look, as, as I indicated, um, you know, I think that at the time um, there was there were other things going on um, that do mean that you know I, I'll give her a little bit more leeway than I would if that had not otherwise been the case. Did you talk to Stuart Nash at all in person? Oh yeah, several conversations. Oh good. With so so what's different with Marima? Uh, in this instance, she'd, she'd already offered up issuing a clarification of her words. I, I was satisfied with the clarification of her words. So what she um, said, so I, in I your did... view, wasn't that egregious? No, it was it was totally wrong. Um, but but not egregious? Not racist? Uh, not egregious? Just factually incorrect? You no, know, as I indicated, Mike, um, I think that there were some other things happening at the time, which meant that she would almost certainly have not been at her best. Um, and I do think that, you know, I've, I've acknowledged that in the response that I have had to the situation. Okay. I think most New Zealanders will be surprised at the way you've handled that. Let me talk to you about health. Uh, under the your targets, 90% of patients should receive an MRI scan within 42 days. 95% of patients referred for a CT should get it within 42 days. Numbers out this morning for Wellington say that's 30 
36 and 57, another we're nowhere close. When do you meet your targets? Um, look, I haven't got information on that specific target, but clearly the health system's been under a lot of pressure. We've got a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that we're delivering the health care that New Zealanders need. I'm not satisfied um, that the health, you know, the health system is delivering what we want it to. Um, that's one of the reasons that we're involved in the reform program at the moment. We, I think we, New Zealanders deserve a better level of health care than what they've been getting. But they're going backwards. So when anywhere in the country do people who are referred for MRI or CAT scans get to get them at the aforementioned government appointed target of 90 or 95 percent i don't have i haven't got a specific briefing in front of me on that particular you don't need a target. briefing just tell me when your policy works when do you meet oh, your target as i've indicated mike I, I don't have a particular the particular context of each individual target at, in front of me at the moment but overall we want to see improvements in health care um, that's one of the reasons that we're engaged in the reform program. We will we we will see improvement over time. This won't. That's what I'm asking. All when? Of the benef- that, well, it won't deliver all of the benefits overnight. If you want, if you want to know when an improvement this on year? a particular target, a, a particular target is um, is expected. I'm happy to to provide that to you. I can't provide it to you off the top of my head though. Ambulance ramping has gone from three thousand hours per quarter to nine thousand seven hundred and fifty six. Why? Sorry, what was that? Ambulance ramping has gone from 3,000 hours in 2019 to 9,756 per quarter. Why? I'm not sure of the number that you're referring to there, Mike. That's to go ambulance that. ramping. That's, that's what happens when the ambulance turns up at the hospital and they can't offload a patient. It's gone from 3,000 hours to 9,756. Why? Um, oh, I'd have to go and have a look at that, Mike. I haven't got, like I said, I haven't got that specific information in front of me. It was on the news last night. Did you see the news? Uh, unfortunately, these days I don't get time to sit down and watch the news every night, Mike. But um, Well, this next part might not go well for you either. Tipu Kinga, remember that? Oh, yes, I do. Good, I remember good. it well, Mike. Steve McCabe, who works for them, who's a senior lecturer at MIT, says it's going to be a death spiral. If we continue to operate in this way, we're going to see the entire edifice just collapse. Twice a month now, my bank statement, my salary comes from Tipu Kinga, not from MIT. That's about the most profound change I've seen. Is he wrong? I think he's he's wrong in terms of you know projecting what's going to happen in the future, but he's not wrong in terms of the situation that got us here. The politics, the sixteen politics we used to have, were all in a, uh, you know a pretty precarious position when the uh, when the reform program. I don't think began. that's true, is it? The, I don't think the they were all in a precarious position, were they? All of the, the projections were that all of them were moving into deficit. The, the drop in enrolments that we've seen across the board um, would suggest that those projections, if anything, were probably conservative. Um, we've seen a decline in enrolments. There are few, fewer people signing up for polytech level on on site provision. Um, the result of that is that the you know that that institution is under significant financial pressure in that area. We're seeing significant growth in the on the job training part, so the apprentice training part, one of the reasons that we brought those two systems together is that that is actually likely to be the future. We are going to see more on-job training, more Mm. apprenticeship training, and we've got to make sure that we've got the system geared up to cope with that. How far off is it for you to declare Te Pukinga a success? Uh, They're they're literally in their sort of first full year of operation as a a single national entity. I think we need to give them some time. The the reform program was always going to be a five to six year reform program. So so in five to six years? At most, we're halfway through that program. So there's still still some further reform to be done. A couple of quick things on the crime stats since you were last on the program. There's been a 46% increase in victimisations. Uh, there has been a 140% increase in serious assaults. There has been a 551% increase in ram raids. And the number of people in prison for that has dropped 45%. Is that crime out of control? Uh, so let's take some of those numbers individually. If we look at the ram raid numbers, we saw that spiking in August last year. And we've put a very intensive level of um, effort into getting that ram, those ram raid numbers down. We've talked about this before, yep. Mike. Since August last year, those numbers have dropped by two thirds on the basis of that intensive intervention, that intensive work we've been doing to identify who those repeat young offenders are and get them out of circulation. Serious that assault. Work is, that work is working. Serious assault. The police are, are actively investigating every one of those. So when someone reports one of those, they can yep. expect the police and, to follow And in that, that lies the problem, because of the young people arrested, only 32% end up with an actual sentence. So in other words, yes, the police arrest them, but nothing happens. Is that a problem? 
Ultimately, you know, the decisions about whether someone's charged, that rests with the police. The decisions about what sentence they get rests with the courts. The fact that um, there's an imprisonment only at 45%, does that bother you? Our government hasn't made any change to the law in this area, Mike. Should so you? They're, they're, still, they're still using the same law that they were using yeah. under the last national... But the number of people in prison has gone down. Why? Uh, ultimately, we've made a much greater focus on rehabilitation, on reducing... So people are being more sure successfully are. rehabilitated now, you're arguing? Uh, well, uh, that's, that's part of the equation. And also, yes, we are looking to reduce... The cycle, you know, to, to re- remove or reduce the cycle of offending that sees people cycling in and out of prison. We actually want to get them to be fully constructive and participating members of society. I've got to go, because, uh, but one more quick thing. Maersk, as in the shipping container people, say we need to get our act together when it comes to uh, the network stability in this country. They look around the world, stability is at 52%, we're at 38%. Are you concerned about that or looking at that or not? That's uh, something I've looked specifically at. I'm very happy to, though. The supply chain, does it bother you? Um, yeah, there have been some real supply chain pressures. Some of that. Yeah, I know, that's what Merck is port. saying. We're worse than most but, of the rest of the world. Are you aware of that? Well, no, but I mean, if you talk to our ports, one of the things that they'll be telling you is that the, the ships that have been coming into port in New Zealand um, have required a lot more offloading in order to access the stuff that we're trying to get off the ship um, because they've been poorly loaded in other ports. That's been, a, I think, a feature in the last few that's years of the supply fault. chain. Well, no, it's a, it's a feature of the fact that the supply chain internationally has been under a lot of pressure. But it's now uh, better. Merck is saying it's better 52% versus our 38%. Well, that, that's good news internationally. Um, Not for us. The, well, the ports are largely privately owned companies, Mike. I'm sure we're happy to have a conversation with them. But aren't you interested in New Zealand doing better, the economy doing better? Oh, absolutely. I'm very happy to talk to the port companies about it. All right, we'll check in next week. Appreciate it very much. Chris Hipkins, 10 to 8.